meeting. So please let the record, I don't feel like it's on, let the record reflect that all board members. Is that bad? Okay, there we go. That's a little better. So good evening. I'd like to call to order the December 9th Lake Washington School Board meeting. So please let the record reflect that all board members are present. Um, and our first step this evening will be to entertain a motion to approve the December 9th agenda. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty to approve the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. So at this time, we will administer the oath of office to the newly elected board members. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to ask uh, Siri, Chris, and Eric if you would join me around the front of the dais while I give you your oath of office. Test, test. Yes, this is on. All right, so now don't do what they do in the movies when I say I state your name. I really mean state your own name. So, you know, comedic, um, comedic relief. And first of all, I also want to say that when we think about school board members, um, they serve with um, a volunteer status. And these are three of the finest board members that I've ever worked with. And we appreciate your service to our district and to our students. And so I want to personally thank you for being willing to come on for another term. And we, we appreciate the consistency that brings and your care for our kids. So I'm going to administer the oath of office. Yes, absolutely, um, if you would like to. But um, first of all, um, I and your name, please. Do you hereby solemnly swear, you hereby solemnly swear that, I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Washington and will faithfully discharge the duties of Director of Lake Washington School District Number 414. In the, county of King, in the county of King, state of Washington, state of Washington according, to the best of my ability. according to the best of my ability. Congratulations on your next term of office. Thank you. So thank you. So our first order of business this evening is public comment. So the Board of Directors does regularly provide opportunities for public comment during board meetings. The public comment period is a time reserved during our working meeting for the board to hear from the public, and we usually have 30 minutes. Please note that public comment is not a question answer session with the board, and the board and superintendent will not respond directly to community members during public comment, as our goal is to listen and to learn from you. Each speaker will be provided up to three minutes, and in order to ensure that we hear from a variety of people, individuals cannot share or donate their time. When your name is called, please approach the podium, speak into the microphone, giving your full name and your school attendance area for the record. We do have a stoplight system over to my left that will show a yellow light when you have one minute left, and red does signify that your three minutes are over. Please wrap up within that time frame. When your name is called, oh, I already did that. It is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. The board does, take, does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff at board meetings. Audience members are expected to treat all attendees with respect and civility. So this evening, I do have two individuals who have signed up, and the first person I have is Kate Teachout. Hello, my name is Kate Teachout. I'm a librarian at Wilder Elementary School. 
and I'm here on behalf of the contract issue. Um, I, in my former life, was a manager at a very successful nursery for several years. Um, and the philosophy of that nursery was that it was the front lines of their people who made the success of that nursery. And they made sure that, that we all knew that and we were supported by that. Um, there was a change of hands and uh, that was not the new philosophy about the front, the people that are boots on the ground, up close. Those were the people that had built the business. So then what happened was um, in three years, all of their managers left, and it left them without that knowledge of working business, and they didn't attract new employees because, new good employees because of the things that were the turmoil and the chaos that was going on there and so shortly after that the company filed for chapter 11 and i feel like that relates a bit to this situation because our secretaries are our front line daily they are like air traffic controllers if we pull them out of that situation it becomes a chaotic place um, they're the glue that holds the school together. They come in contact and build the community of our school because our parents see them from kindergarten through fifth grade. So six years of a parent, the teachers don't see them as much as the secretaries do. And they also support the teachers and the custodians and oversee budget, and they deserve to be supported in their work. And I realize that I am only one stakeholder in this issue and that I don't see every every aspect of it. But that being said, I do know that good secretaries are an essential part of a school and the success of a district. So I'm here to ask you to do the right thing for schools and our students and the communities. Um, and as the John Burroughs, the great naturalist said, I'm here to ask you to leap and know that the net will appear because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. The next individual signed up is Mary Kay Weinmeister. Hello, um, I'm Mary Kay Weinmeister. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Norman Rockwell, and I'm speaking as a parent of five Redmond High, Redmond Middle, and Rockwell graduates, um, as a teacher and as a taxpayer in the district. And I just need you to know I'm very sad that my colleagues are working without a contract and are having to fight for fair compensation. The district's word this year is elevate. And I think it's strange that the message from the district, <laughs> it's strange that the message from the district is to elevate ourselves and our students when it feels like the district is pushing our colleagues down. It's time to practice what you preach and elevate all the valuable employees of this district to a place of respect by coming to a fair agreement. We rise when we lift others up. Please show our colleagues the respect they deserve and lift them up so they may feel valued by our district for all the hard work they do every day. I know my school could not run without them. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So our next item on the agenda tonight is the host school, and we have Juanita High School here this evening. So Dr. Stapham. Yes, I'm going to ask Principal Kelly Clapp to come to the podium, and while she's doing that, we're gonna open with our video of the newly minted Phase One Juanita High School, which I have told people is probably in my top three favorite designs. Um, with the finishes and just the, the way that the space is being utilized by our students is pretty exciting, particularly if you were in old Juanita and know kind of um, what the difference between the two is. So we're going to roll that first. <laughs> We have 50 years of Juanita High School. And so there is a long tradition and the community cares about the school. I 
think having the school be a hub of the community is really important. We want the end that everybody feels warm and welcome with either one of these and are learning here in our school and finding multiple ways and being able to share it with staff so that we can develop an action plan, you know, based on what kids are saying, what are we going to do differently? What are kids going to do differently to make this our school? The new school just kind of like, it, it signifies like a new culture here at Juanita and like how everything's changing and I think it's changing for the better. It's more like serious and focused on school. I feel like when we had the portables, everyone was kind of, it was kind of hectic. It was really hard. It was hard to focus, mm -hmm. but it's a lot easier to focus with the new technology and the new school. My favorite part would probably be like right here in the cafeteria. It just looks so cool that you can just look over and see everything. And just the big, tall ceilings, it gives you a nice homey feel and you feel comfortable and welcome to be here all day. Most of our kids are in here during lunch and there's lots of interesting different spaces for kids to be sitting in. They can sit on these wonderful stairs here, they can sit up above, they can sit on different kinds of tables, and so kids have all found a place to be. It's such a huge fan of our new space, getting to walk in and have students right from the main office be able to see the College and Career Center. They just have so much access to being able to see what they can do next. It's been so nice to be so visible for students that they can pop in, ask questions um, on their way to class or just right in as they're coming into school or leaving school. This space is an incredibly helpful um, area of, um, because we only we have two people to help us um, mm -hmm. through like scholarships, financial aid, and even preparing ourselves for college. Mm -hmm. I would consider this place a really safe space for people like us to also eat lunch. At the same time, build stronger relationships. For me, um, honestly, like in the beginning, I didn't really know about the application process mm -hmm. and stuff so when I was lost I came here for my answers and most of my questions that that I asked were answered. This is the Japanese three class. The whole time during this class, we're supposed to be speaking only Japanese. You guys probably won't understand everything that we're going to be saying <laughs> because we're mostly going to be speaking Japanese in here. Thank you for having me in your classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, eto, uh, Steve Sensei wa arigato gozaimasu imas. Thank you. Well, I think now that we're in this building, it has changed drastically. This is something cool to watch, mm -hmm. but it isn't so much interfering with what we were doing when we were so many people down in the portables mm -hmm. and then having to go back and forth and walking by it. When they first put in the steel, everybody was watching. It was like, oh my mm -hmm. gosh, because you see the cranes come in and set yeah. it. and. And we'll, there'll be oohs and ahs when they put in windows. There's just, yeah. when different things happen, people notice. The library is a safe place for us. Uh, certain types of kids too, that like, they, they come here right when their lunch starts and this is the place they want to hang out and we do our best to like, be in good relations with them. I'm actually hoping the physical space and how pleasant this is, I call it a Starbucks with books, mm -hmm. um, is going to draw more kids in to become readers. Uh, and to maybe uh, have some kind of virtuous cycle of positivity towards reading. The design of this high school was um, well thought out for the diversity of space needed for our um, programs for students who have some special needs and our special education programming. They love it. Um, talk to Paras and the teachers. They, this is just a marvelous place to be in, mm -hmm. and just and also having a meeting space there that makes it easier for families mm -hmm. when we have IEPs. They have a conference room. You can meet with families whether it's for a formalized IEP or it's mm -hmm. just a, a meeting, a quick check-in, and everything's just right there. It's very helpful. So Juanita is still the best school in the nation. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> but I'm also a lot more inspired by this new building. It kind of inspires me to work a lot harder and be more successful in my life. Now I think. I think we have some work to do to make sure that every kid feels like this is our school. So we're excited. It's a good start. So Kelly, before you get started, 
one of the first things that I saw when I came to the district was a construction site at Juanita High School. So even though we are not through with construction there, we certainly want to thank you for everything that you did along with your staff to navigate that very challenging, just physical um, construction site last year. And it's really fun to see things now in the new in the new part and it will be even more fun next year. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I think we ought to change the order of that. You show the video after me, so now I have to go after the video because that was super cool. Um, good evening. This is now my third year of serving as a principal of Juanita and Future School, and I am pleased to be here to share some information about both of our schools. You have all seen the pictures of phase one of our beautiful school. And this is obviously a picture of the front. Um, this construction project done in phases has had an extremely huge impact on staff, the community, and students. It has been hard. Even though we see the end in sight, it is difficult. We are now in our final year, um, but we still have a fair amount of classes and portables. We have the majority of our math classes, social studies, EL students, our future school, some English classes, and, and a few odds and ends. We are very much looking forward to being in the same place next year. But being in a new building has allowed for some new opportunities, and you can see some of the things that we're looking forward to. I'll highlight a couple of things. Um, our new classrooms are meant to be flexible and to allow for different content areas um, to use that space, and so it can accommodate the changing needs we have in our school. And our shared learning spaces with full uh, complement of technology allows students and teachers to work in there and allow for flexible groupings and a differentiated learning experience. I'd um, like to focus on our brand and identity. Um, the new building gave us an opportunity to look at the logos and our crest. Anything associated with our school needs to be positive and reflect the values and who we are for all of our families and all of our students. Um, you can see our updated crest. It has all of the elements of the original crest, the mountains, the colors, the eagle, um, the date of our establishment, 1971. Um, we did take out the cross swords because of the connotation of that. And then there we have um, this new crest. We also now have consistent logos that we have identified for everybody to use, whether it be for athletics or activities. And this is important because gra um, graphics are symbols created to support the public recognition of any institution to make us stand out in a consistent way. And we thought that that was really important. And a new building also means updating our traditions, and that's staff and students. Uh, for example, our student leaders are trying different events, um, such as a rebel family night. Now that we have a space to do something fun, like having a movie night, because we have the technology, we have a space to hang out, and so this is exciting for kids. Uh, some demographics about Juanita High School. Um, this is from 1819 and hasn't uh, changed drastically uh, this year. You could, the, that number 1485 includes our running start from last year. This year we're about 1423. Um, Future School is our school. It is its own school, um, but it's only for juniors and seniors, and so the, the population is a lot less. Last year we had 33, this year we are currently at 22, but just know that it fluctuates. I'm choosing to focus on, there's a lot of data that you can show from high school. <laughs> and I have a few pieces and that will lead us into how we chose our goals for the year. Um, you can see I have our ELA and math data. And we took a dip in both ELA and math and we are aware that math is particularly concerning and so we are uh, taking some steps uh, to address some of the issues with math. Um, and it isn't up here, but we have some science data from the WACAS as well. And the WACAS is reported based on the number of juniors we have, not based on the achievement of the students who took the test. And so we're reported as 42.4%, but we did a little math, and out of the students who took the test, which is about 220 out of our junior class, it was 64 point something percent. And we had by far and above the most students take the test. So whatever our science teachers did to um, get our kids to take it is good. Good piece of news. Our graduation rates, um, overall, they're good. Um, you can see 
we've had a steady increase, but if we want to keep on working um, to ensure that students are are passing in four years or graduating in four years, that means that they are earning credits in the required area and that they have a pathway to attain it. We do have some challenges that aren't reflected in this data. Um, for example, only 50% of our EL students are graduating in four years. 66% of our black and African American students. However, we do have some good news from our futures school. Um, our futures data from last year shows that 100% of the students who are enrolled in futures who identified as black or African American or Asian, 100% of them graduated in their four years. So once they enrolled, they got on a path to graduate and um, had success, so that's a great thing. Here's some additional data. Um, this one shows uh, ninth graders, and it's by group, subgroup, um, who've earned six or more credits by the end of their ninth grade year. And it's about being on time for graduation. Um, it shows that, that we have some definite gaps between our subgroups. Again, our EL students particularly. But this data is showing that kids are getting behind in ninth grade. And that's not a good thing, because if we don't do something about it now, they continue to get behind because it doesn't get easier as you go through high school. So we want to be able to focus on our ninth graders. So that leads us to um, some of the goals and priorities that we established for our school this year. In order to up our game a little bit, we have our school improvement plan priorities, increasing the number of ninth graders who are on track for graduation. And that means looking at uh, the classes that they're passing, looking at quarter data, looking at semester data, and then deciding what are we going to do about it if they're behind. Increasing the passing rate of our ninth graders in their math classes. Um, the number of students who failed their ninth grade math class, which was far and away algebra, um, was way more than any other core class. And we know that, so we're taking some steps to kind of figure out what we need to do about that. And then we want to implement a school-wide PBIS program. And so goals are great, but we have to have some strategies to address them. Oops, we kind of get... Um, we have something called our um, Establish, Maintain, and Restore, which is EMR. That is a pilot program that we're doing through the University of Washington this year. And what it is, and I think we all know this, that um, relationships are the heart of helping kids be successful in school. But this kind of gives us a little a systematic way of figuring out what we need to do and find out if it's working. So we have a group of researchers who are coming in and they're meeting with a group of voluntary um, teachers who teach ninth grade. And they're actually learning strategies and tools um, in all parts of establishing relationships. What do you do to keep them going throughout the year, that maintenance? And then what happens when things go wrong? Because they will. And then so that's the restore part. And then and uh, we have some pre and post data that we will be looking at um, to help us determine if it's been successful from survey data and also achievement data. We have AVID. We are in our second year of AVID, and this year we're trying to focus on school-wide um, focused note-taking to see if that helps um, help students keep focused in their schoolwork. We have something called our academic connection time, which is, we call it AC time. Um, it's our intervention period. We know it's not enough. Um, it's, it's a struggle because intervention is not by invitation. Um, so this little bit of time that we have, we need to find other ways to help kids who aren't getting it or who already know it. Our homeroom time is for culture building, but it's our, not only for clubs, but it's also a place where we have our school-wide lessons. Examples can be our high school and beyond STEM mental health. Um, and also we did a, a recent one on mindfulness, which is we, all of us could use a few lessons on that, I think. Um, and then, of course, using a culturally responsive teaching practices. We've done a lot of work around PSYOP strategies, um, which are really good strategies for all kids, uh, incorporating AVID, and then other evidence-based strategies to improve the learning experience for all kids. And then lastly, our PBIS. And the slide here shows our dean of students, and his name is Breck Ivey. And he's been a game changer in our school. And for those of you who don't, I, I think you know, PBIS is positive behavior intervention and support. And um, Breck has been great because he's been a trainer for PBIS in a different school district before we were able to snap him up. And so he's one of the leads in this work. And PBIS implementation is hard work in any school. Um, 
in any place, and sometimes it takes years, but it's particularly difficult in a secondary school. The words on the poster here are the three words that are the threads for the kind of environment we want at JHS, which is respectful, responsible, and safe. And this shows an example. PBIS means setting common expectations and in places. And um, how are we showing that we're safe? How are we showing that we're respectful? And how are we showing that we're responsible? We decided to kind of pick the low hanging fruit and try one just in the commons. You wouldn't think that you would have to work so hard with young adults and just picking up their trash, but we do. Um, so <laughs> this is uh, one of the places that we've started. Okay, my slides got a little bit out of order here, excuse me. Um, and also to serve the needs of students, we have a number of programs. We have EL. Um, our EL numbers have grown sufficiently so that we have uh, more than, well, 2.2 teachers working with our students. And the picture that you see here is actually a picture of one of our EL classes. And we have fabulous EL teachers. And they are working hard for um, all of our students. We have our Cambridge program. Cambridge program is a, a choice program, and so we get students from all around the district who, if they get in through the lottery, we have two uh, classes at each grade level. Um, last year, the graduating class of 2019, 98% of the students from that class went on to a four-year university. And um, every year, we don't have the data from last year yet, but every year that there's been Cambridge, we've had somebody who's um, been awarded the, the top in the United States Learner Award. That means that they, ordered, uh, they earned a top score in a subject matter area. So that, that's kind of a big deal. And then uh, we have also AP STEM. We have our special education. Um, and last but not least, I, I want to talk about futures. Uh, the secret sauce to the success of our future school is it creates a culture of community and family. And I bring that up because I. I think we need to figure out what it is that they're doing, and we want it to spread to all of Juanita. Um, kids enter the program feeling defeated and without hope, but they leave with a diploma and a vision for what their futures can be. I have a stack of 15 letters sitting on my desk in my office, and every letter is from a former future student, including um, a letter that I just got this week from a former student who is now a parent in our school. And she talked about what futures meant to her. And um, every single letter speaks to the sense of family, support, and belief in success and change of each kid. So th that is obviously really important. One of the joys of working in a comprehensive high school are the opportunities for kids outside the walls of a classroom. We are proud of our activities and athletics programs. Um, I actually took this slide from a recent presentation, and it is not inclusive of all of our clubs, but it just shows a few of them. Um, we have a lot of really neat things going on, and you can see some of them are around here. Some of them are athletics, and some of them are what's happening in the classroom, but um, it, it's good stuff. And then when you work and learn in a school that's been in existence for almost 15 years, 50 years, excuse me, there's a fair amount of pride and tradition that goes with that. And one of the mottos is once a rebel, always a rebel. Um, and I think there's a fair amount of people that, that live that. Um, the students in this picture are from our Leadership 2 class. And part of the work they do is to keep those connections alive between school and community, yet to continue to build on what is relevant for the kids who are currently attending our school. And this year, their theme has been revolution. You know, how are we moving forward with some positive change? I love that. And it's a perfect way to think about what we, uh, all we need to do to work together to make Juanita a great place for all kids. This motto has meaning for staff, many of whom have spent the majority of their careers at Juanita High School. And then of course it has meaning for our community. We have many former rebels who attend our athletic events and other performances and activities and care about what is happening in our school. And whether they were rebs themselves or not, we have an active community in PTSA who give generously of their time and energy to support students and staff in multiple ways. And for that we are extremely grateful. I'm going to leave you with a quote uh, from Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So I thank you um, for helping and giving your support in arming our students for their futures.
Okay, she ran away. Oh, they're fine. I have to say, uh, at one of the Juanita High football games, I met the aunt who brings cupcakes for like the entire crowd. And so when they talk about community support and tradition, cupcakes apparently are a big tradition, and I got one. So kind of a, kind of a great night, but great to see um, kind of how they're blending the former with the new version of Juanita and maintaining that sense of history. Director Stewart? Kelly, can I get a subscription to the uh, newspaper and the magazine? Pardon? Can I get a subscription to your newspaper and magazine? High school journalism is a passion of mine. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Any other questions or? So, uh, also in terms of feedback on that, yes, there's there was a dip in scores, but I I have to say to Pr Principal Clapp that the the dip you saw in scores last year, relative to what it could have been, given you were under construction, is impressively small. So I'm not too m miffed by. Yeah, there was a dip. There had to be a dip. It was just how big would it be? That was smaller than I expected. <laughs> no, but that's that's a key point because really here, you can't me. you can't not have that big of a physical plant impact not impact student learning. I mean, it just it it's a precarious thing. So it, it will be exciting to kind of see the impact of the new facility on achievement too. And Director Sage? So being the mother of three Juanita Rebel graduates and the mother of a 16-year-old junior who is still there, it makes such a difference to have natural light coming into the building versus all interior classrooms. It, it, I can't even explain how you feel when you walk into the new building. Is it's, it's happier. You walk in and you feel light, and, and uh, Principal Clapp has done a fantastic job managing construction with all of this. I, I think it takes a special person to be able to do both. Thank you. I, I feel like, you know, in The Wizard of Oz, when it goes from black and white into color, that's kind of how it feels. I'd also at some point, futures, it was, thank you for including futures in Cambridge and all of that. It is, it is always an interesting piece. There is, I think, a lot to be learned from futures, as you mentioned. How do you do that community? And how do we build that component through in many ways? So appreciate all the work and effort in creating multiple different avenues for students to be engaged in different ways. I had a great opportunity to, to visit the future school a couple of years ago or so. And to me, it's great. I mean, the idea of not allowing kids to slip through the cracks because they've had trouble or a, dis a difficult situation at home, uh, at school, whatever. Everyone deserves a second, third, or fourth chance, and they're getting it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and appreciate hearing more about Juanita High School and look forward to the second half opening up in the fall of next year. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give one more prop to that I usually always forget, and that is that John Knorr, who runs our video here in our board meetings, is the one putting together our wonderful videos, which have been really great to then have on the, the website as a repository, and a lot of people are looking at those apart from the board meetings. So thank you, John, if you can hear us back there. Good job. All right, so our next item on the agenda this evening is the approval of the consent agenda. So I will now entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. Been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director LaLiberty to approve the consent agenda. Dr. Stavon, would you please pull the board? Sure. Director Sage? Yes. Director LaLiberty? Yes. Director Stewart? Yes. President Bleasner? Yes. Director Carlson? Yes. And if you can do us the favor, please, to please summarize the donations that were provided. I will. This month we have um, from the PTSA an amount of $32,797.58 and from private sources in the amount of $6,572.49 for a grand total of donations in the amount of $39,370.07. Excellent. Again, we are always very thankful for the generosity of our community and supporting our students. So our next item on the agenda tonight 
is the second reading and approval of the new procedures for graduation requirements. So Dr. Stavum. Yes, and this is um, for our second reading, and I've asked um, Mike Van Orden if he would just give us a brief update on some of the adjustments that we made since first reading so that we can um, just kind of keep track of those. And we reviewed that at the November 4th study session. It was presented for first reading in November 18th board meeting. So just as a reminder, it's on for approval tonight. Thank you. So uh, as a reminder for the second reading, this, um, the requirements are coming from House Bill 1599, uh, which was put in place to really offer more options for students to uh, meet graduation requirements. So it didn't necessarily add more requirements, it added more options, which is a nuanced difference. Um, so in the past, for example, students um, were required to meet uh, standard on a state assessment. Now in addition to that, they have a series of other options. Um, in addition, it gave students in middle school some additional options for how credit gets moved into the high school. So so um, again, um, not necessarily new uh, hoops that students have to jump through, but more options for students to demonstrate competency. I also wanted to provide a little bit of context. Um, when we have new graduation requirements, our State Board of Education provides rules around those. Um, and so all the way through November, the State Board of Education was developing rules in response to feedback that they'd been receiving from different stakeholder groups, and actively working towards um, getting information from those groups. And then in addition, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction has been providing guidance and rulemaking. The reason I bring this up is because as recently as a few weeks ago and after the last presentation, at a board meeting, there was still guidance coming in. So um, as an example, one day we were presenting to a group of high school principals. We prepped the meeting information. The following day, there had been rulemaking changes that we had to catch up on and, and uh, put into that meeting. So the guidance that's been coming up and the rulemaking that's been coming up has followed uh, the passage of House Bill 1599. And so what you're seeing tonight are responses to some of those changes and guidance that we've been getting. Um, we, you might then have the question, well, when is that all going to end? Guidance will continue to come. Um, at the same time, we do have requirements that are being enacted for the class of 2020. We wanna make sure we have those in our policy. So what I wanna do with tonight is just walk you through what some of those updates are. Um, to start with, uh, as Dr. Stava mentioned, we, we had our prior reading, so since then, um, there's been some information around um, an opportunity for students to waive credit. So this has been in our graduation uh, policy and procedures for a number of years. Um, students can waive credits, which means of the 24 credits, two of those can be put aside for um, what used to be what were called unusual circumstances. Now those couldn't be for courses that were part of the core required courses, so it would be their elective classes. And in the past, they had language that unusual circumstances. The state board received guidance on that, saying that that was giving us lots of heartache. We don't know what unusual means. So we want some guidance around what unusual means. And unusual, there are lots of things that could mean. So why don't you just say student circumstances and then give some guide, guidance about what examples of those might be. So what we've done is we've taken out that language unusual, put in student circumstances based on state board guidance, and then put in examples of um, types of circumstances, again, as examples from state board guidance. So that's now in our policy, and it wasn't in the last reading. In addition, um, this was the example I shared. We were presenting to high school principals, and overnight the, the guidance changed. So um, as you rec may recall from last time, students can take a sequence of two courses in a CTE pathway. So for example, business and marketing. Um, and if that sequence allows students to earn dual credit, then they can meet one of the graduation pathway options. Well, there's also another option if they take it in, take courses in two different program areas, say business and marketing and environmental science, that there is a way to have a committee say, we think those two are a good sequence, they allow students to demonstrate competency in ELA and math, we're giving that a thumbs up as a district. Well, OSPI got weighed in on this and said, we want to have the final say, so you need to run it by us. And so there were, there were new rules that were put in saying that OSPI has to approve um, out of program area sequences. So again, something we thought, you know, we should have that in our procedures as well. Um, so we you know, have a new CTE director that comes in in a few years and doesn't say, well, I can just add whatever I want. We know we have to have a district process and a state process. In addition, there was some new language around students with IEPs. Um, in the past, an IEP team could say, you know, let's, a student may not be able to succeed in a geometry class, so we're gonna set that aside. They don't have to take geometry. Um, there was some um, guidance around that that 
led the state board to think that if you do that, you're actually modifying a diploma. And so what they say now is you can't waive an entire class. You can provide students with different ways to access the content. And so that required a change in the way we wrote the language, saying an IEP team could say, you can still get your geometry information, but you might get it in a different type of class or in a different format, but you still need to demonstrate competency in geometry. You can't just throw it out altogether, because that would be changing the diploma. So again, we updated that language in our policy, our procedures, excuse me. Um, and then in addition to that, as we were going through, we were finding some places where we just wanted to make sure we had really tight, clean language. So um, there were some places, for example, in um, page 22B, there was some language around the credits that moved from middle school to high school. We just cleaned those up to be really tight with the state, um, state board language and House Bill 1599 RCWs. Um, similarly, there were some changes. Um, again, they're, they're minor word changes, but they're meaningful um, in the content requirements in social studies. So for example, it used to say Native American culture. Well, we know there are multiple cultures in Native American um, communities, and so they updated the language to reflect that, and so we made some adjustments there just to make sure we were following along in that way. In addition, along those lines, there were some new standards that have come out recently. So the language that we've had in our policy and the language that used to be in um, the graduation requirements was fitness. It's now physical education. Again, you may, if you've been around long enough, we've gone back and forth on that. Um, and they also changed the language a little bit in the um, ability for students to demonstrate competency and proficiency through the assessment if they waive um, the, the course taking requirement. They just notched it up a bit. So it's just making language um, saying you really have to show competency and mastery as opposed to proficiency was a lighter term. I'm sure there was a committee that worked on that for a number of weeks or months. Um, the other things we put in, and we went back and forth on, on these ones, um, there are some requirements specifically for the class of 2020 and 21 that are going to go away in a year or two. And so originally we were going, well, do we even put this in our current um, language knowing that um, it's going to be out? dated in two years. And we thought it was important to have it in there. So as families are looking at a class of 2020 student that's going to do the Certificate of Individual Achievement, um, or 20, 2021, that they know that's there and they can see it. In two years, we'll have to come back, or next year, we'll have to come back and pull that out, or just know that those do go out of date. So we put the, the dates in as well. And then finally, the last one, we, um, as we were reviewing, um, and based on some feedback we got from the board, there were some questions about, well, the, this credit hour, where is that coming from? And we actually went back and looked and recognized that in 2018, when we changed to the seven period day, as you know, there are um, different schedules, but you might have three days a week with a 50 minute schedule, and then you might have a day that has a block period. Well, those minutes came in less than the 150 we originally have. Now they're about 135 for an individual class. So we wanted to make sure that our language reflected the actual number of minutes instead of the minutes under the six period day. So again, opportunities to go through and just get our procedures really clean and really tight so when people are using them, um, they're updated and the latest. And again, that's not to say we won't be getting guidance from OSPI over the coming years and we'll want to make adjustments there. But at the same time, when we have an opportunity at this final reading, we wanted to make sure you had the latest updates possible. So that, um, those were the updates. I can take questions on those, and then I can just talk to you about our, our next steps in terms of um, communication and all of that. But I did want to pause and see if there were questions. Any questions on the updates? Director Stewart? Yeah. Um, Sorry. As the students try to monitor their credits, uh, are the students and parents the primary monitors of the credits toward graduation? A good, or, good question. Uh, no, we actually are able to track that in our student information system. Mm -hmm. um, so we can track that they have credits, they have credits in the right areas, and then there are flags that will come up if a student's missing those. Um, students can also access that information so they can see where their credits. So it's not only the number, but it's also the individual courses that match those. To make sure they're actually <laughs> monitoring yes. it well yeah. or understand the process, especially yeah. parents. Yeah. Um, are the counselors and the uh, or perhaps even the homeroom teachers part of that process? Yeah. Yes, in fact, we just went through and our counselors are already pinging us saying, with these new procedures, there are three kids that we've recognized that are gonna need to have X, Y, or Z. And so our counselors are already starting okay. to find those kids and meet with them um, and look for alternatives. So our counselors actually, when they see a student's credit deficient, start going through all the different options that they have to get them on track. Sometimes that includes summer school, sometimes that includes credit recovery, but they are, they're constantly looking for those kids that aren't going to be on track for graduation. Well, knowing that we have not as many counselors as we'd love to have, 
uh, are the homeroom teachers kind of the backup for that or not? Um, through the college and career readiness or the um, student, uh, high school and beyond plan, the students are doing that so that student, it might come up. It's not, it's not as direct though as a counselor, but it might come up as the students planning and they're okay. ma mapping out their schedule for the following year. Any other questions? Okay. So I did want to just give you an update on how, uh, what next steps would be if approved. Um, we would take our procedures and those will be posted on our district website for um, community and staff to access. We're also working on and have it drafted based on information we've been gathering from staff and FAQ because we want our administrators and our counselors and teachers to use this, these procedures properly. Um, we have updates that are in the queue and ready to go um, for our high school and middle school course catalog, so the language around the new pathway options are in those. Um, we have an update for our high school guide on our district website, and again, it's sitting there waiting to flip the switch um, to actually go live. And then we're planning on setting letters home to 6th through 12th grade families that will include, um, for middle school, information about the high school credits in middle school, and for high school, the new pathway options. Um, we'll also have information and focus and connections. We're working as well with our counselors and high school principals to talk about what does all this look like in the school setting so that students are getting guidance, particularly our seniors, uh, for whom some of these things would actually be options for them if they didn't meet SBA. Any questions? I just have a question on the different graduation pathways that are there and knowing that some of those have financial implications such as the ACT and SAT. Um, I don't know if the ASVAP does actually, um, but looking around those as options, are we ensuring that all families and students will have access to those and that finance won't be a concern of any kind? Great question, actually. Uh, Tim Krieger, if you know him, just uh, emailed me today saying um, we're ready to start looking at what are some options for ASVAB, for example, or SAT and ACT. So what he's doing right now is pulling up data on which students are taking the numbers. Um, Lake Washington, for example, does offer ASVAB during the school day. So we're, we're gathering some information, so it is something we're actively looking into. Um, Partly it's the cost, and so I think we, we costed it out initially. It's about $100,000 if we were to pay for every SAT, every student to have SAT and ACT. Um, again, so we, we'll gather some information, but yes, something we're considering. So that's great. It's similar to the STAMP program. I think for World Language, right. it was the same concept yeah. of if we're going to have this as a possibility, then First as a district, pay. I believe that's our responsibility to also cover that cost. Yeah. Um, so any other questions? Um, so I think that's it for the questions, and we'll have them for the only other one piece, even before we do approval, and this will be for future, is I'm assuming you're looking at how you'll be tracking which options are being utilized and how that will be looking at, because I know the other question that comes up here is around equity um, and concerns of how, how are students choosing these and making sure that the pathway is not chosen for them, but it is their choice. Mm -hmm. um, and just making sure that we're tracking that and yeah. paying attention to that. Yes, we're actually doing that right now. Even as we speak, we've been mocking that up to see which kids are meeting which pathway requirements, or if kids that didn't meet standard on SBA, are there other pathways that are actually going to help them to get through graduation? And we're finding not large numbers, but anywhere from three to five, 10 for each of the pathway options. So ASVAB is an example. We have students that didn't meet standard on SBA, but did meet ASVAB. And so they'll be able to graduate as a result of that. So those are the types of things we're looking for. I'd also be intrigued that you know some of the demographics behind mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, what are those GPAs that, so just mm -hmm. some of those components right. in right. there. So we make sure that we're still maintaining the rigor behind what we're doing. Those are really good questions, and I think those are some of the unintended positive consequences where we can maybe be a little bit more diagnostic in the paths to some of those um, qualifiers and looking back from them to see if we can see some trends. I know from former experience, um, Kelly mentioned earlier some of the passing rates for algebra and things like that. You can begin to kind of see if X happened. Oh, I'm using my algebra skills right now. If X happened, then... What is why? No, but um, predictors and things that become kind of barriers to a particular uh, pathway to graduation, I think if, if we use it in the right way and we have that capability right from the get-go, that will help us to kind of trace some things back and get some good information. So that's a great question to ask. All right, and with that, I will entertain a motion to approve the Policy 2410P graduation requirements. 
So moved. Second. It's been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Carlson to approve 2410 graduation requirement P, graduation requirements as presented. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Well, thank you for all your work on that and getting that taken care of. It'll be exciting what happens with it. So our next item on the agenda is the public and community affairs. And so I will pass this off to Director La Liberty. We had our uh, first meeting uh, this morning with a um, with one of our state senators. Uh, it went very well. Uh, I thought it was a very good conversation. Those meetings will continue throughout this week and throughout this month uh, as we seek to explain to our uh, to our electeds, uh, statewide electeds, what uh, is important to our district uh, in this upcoming session. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. All right. So we're moving on from there. We have the superintendent report is next. So, whoops, got to turn that on. A couple of things tonight. One is um, we have just finalized, as of this afternoon, our strategic plan update. And so we are hoping to do frequent updates of the progress made on the strategic plan. We'll be going over that tomorrow with DLT. And then um, Shannon and her team have developed a nice one-page document that we'll be pushing out publicly to just show, even as of December, all of the great work that's happening around our strategic plan. So that's an exciting thing. We'll also have the annual report that still is required of districts. That will come out later in the year. But this is just specific to that strategic plan process. So I'm going to, uh, do you want to be my clicker, Matt? I can be All right, clicker. then I'll stay here. Um, second thing the uh, list tonight is an update on school start times. And so I want to preface this just with saying that we know this is something um, that was a big adjustment a few years ago that a lot of work and um, thought went into for a variety of reasons, but it resulted in some changes in start and end times to our school schedule. So last year, rather than um, making additional changes, we really wanted to take time to see what we knew at that point about some of the effects of those changes and to really take time to look at all of the variables that would go into any additional changes. I also want to say that there are, are some very um, important things to make mention of. One is that we are very aware of the research that exists about um, adolescence in particular and the importance of sleep and circadian rhythms and all of the things that help them to experience a high degree of wellness, both academically as well as emotionally and socially. And then um, the second piece is just wanting to be very respectful of parents and the adjustments that were made initially with um, childcare arrangements and work schedules and all of the ways that, that that kind of created some disruption for our families. And so that being said, those are two things that will continue to be um, foremost in our minds as we look at the uh, possibility of moving anything for, for any number of reasons, but um, what, when we look at our overall start and end times, um, some of the recommendations that came through from last year is if you think of those earliest start times and those latest dismissal times as kind of bookends in our district, our goal would be to kind of bring those bookends a little bit closer together so that the earliest times would be a little bit later and the late ending times would be just a little bit earlier. So um, just to, to go over some of the factors that we examined as we looked at, do we make any changes for next year, do we not? We, we wanted to honor that original process that happened in our district that brought us to the point where the changes were made initially. Um, as I mentioned before, just the impacts on our current family schedules and what that looks like for people who have obtained um, child care, for people who adjusted work schedules and pick up and drop off and all of those um, nuances that are, are now um, adjusted to our current times. We looked at the advisory committee um, review and recommendations. They took a real thorough look at all of the different components. They did some listening sessions with students, with community members and family members, with staff members, and tried to either confirm or um, question some of the things that we knew at that point. 
We also took time to look at current program models. And when we think about program models, it's the where a program might be um, taking place, it's the when, it's the how, it's the staffing, it's the, it's the physical location. And so when we think about things like our choice program, our preschool programming, um, Quest, Music, WANIC, all of those things that are, are kind of um, located specifically and may require transportation, we said if we were to undo any of those um, to some degree, what would be the impact on transportation and staffing? And the answer is they would be s fairly significant. We also have space constraints. Um, we still have over 160 portables in use across our district. We have very little um, flexibility as it is with current school programming that's already within a school. And when we look at changing any of those variables, lots of dominoes begin to fall just because of our lack of um, space flexibility. And then we looked um, at our current transportation model and our policies that determine who gets transportation and, and the location specific parameters that the district has put into place. So all of those things considered, um, what we are determining for next year is that there will be no change to our current start and dismissal schedule. And we will continue to um, think about any measure of flexibility that we may be able to add over time. But right now, um, we don't have very much flexibility with space. Um, with the high school seven period day being still relatively new, um, we wanna review that as we continue through that schedule change, but also um, we know there will come a point after we've had a full four year cycle of students who have moved through that to see if the changes that were put in place are doing what they were designed to do. Um, we'll continue to look at program model changes just in terms of, um, for instance, a, an elementary music program. Could that be moved back to a home elementary site instead of having to be transitioned from a, a middle school site back then to your elementary after you're done um, with your uh, music program? Um, then we know for preschool for next year, we'll be moving our preschool to the old Redmond schoolhouse site. We know that that will have um, some effect on transportation routes. Um, we'll look at that policy for transportation over time. And then another need that we know that we have right now is before and after childcare. So families who need to get to work earlier um, may need to stay later. They need great options for where their children are going to be while they are not yet able to pick them up or drop them off. And we have some gaps there. We have some wait lists. We have um, some places that may not be um, uh, at capacity for what they might be able to have in some of our schools. And so we are actively looking at that right now, of where can we fill those gaps so that even if we have later than we would like to have um, release times at our elementary schools, can we fill that gap for a parent by having a great place for their child to be until they are able to come and get them. So what we know um, from looking at all of these components for next year in particular is that any of the potential revisions that we may want to do have some really massive implications to different parts of our systems and that none of those can be solved with kind of short-term thinking or without a long-range plan of some sort. Um, we talked uh, earlier this evening and in this um, process of review that even to make um, minor changes to high school schedules and course offerings has to happen almost a year and a half in advance in order to have um, the time to prepare for staffing, for schedule changes, for how we publish course catalogs and do registration. So there are some things that I think seem like relatively simple things to do. Um, and I made the analogy earlier that as we look at some of the variables in this school district with um, traffic and the density factor and our space considerations, it feels a little bit like being in a room with um, very few windows and doors and corners that we run into quite often. So I'm thinking about this also just in terms of the upcoming legislative session. A lot of our needs come back to space and our ability to continue building new facilities and redesigning our existing facilities so that when we go to add 
uh, a new elementary school that we might have the capability to add some spaces that can accommodate some of the needs that we're thinking about with programs or with early childhood or with before and after school programming. In some places we have um, a large number of kids participating and we need even more space if we to, were to add another 50 to 100 students. So all of that needs to be part of our thinking as we look at all kinds of variables in the coming years. But we we do want families and our staff to be able to plan forward, and so um, making that decision now to leave start times as they are is one that we wanted to get out before the break so that people can anticipate what they need to do for next year's planning. We'll be communicating this information through our, our district uh, communication channels, our publications, our website. We'll be sharing it. Um, a great suggestion earlier was with our PTSA and um, asking all of our partners to help us with that information. And then we'll um, be sharing some context around that as we go as well with our administrators and at school level um, news tools communication tools at our school level. So we appreciate the work. A lot of people really um, dug into this to look at any possible revisions that we could make. As I said earlier too, we have to be very cautious that if we do go to solve um, one problem that we don't inadvertently create others in the process. And so we need to be very thoughtful and purposeful about any work that requires us to then um, kind of create a bit of upset um, with scheduling and things like that. So um, thank you for Getting the slides up, Matt. Questions? Just a quick question. Is there a time period in which you're going to let us know what some of those flexible options are as they come forth as you continue this journey? We'll be continuing to look at any of those um, areas that we think might be possibilities and adding some additional flexibility. Um, I don't have a timeline for that. We agreed earlier that we would check in as a board um, with some regularity. And I think as we start to look purposefully at what might be possible, there will be things that we'll want to report back and, and dig into a little further. So we will do that when we know something or when we all collectively want an update. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well thank you, appreciate the report. Um, it is a complicated process in which it does. And so looking at those places where we can make those changes over time and that long-term planning is, is a great thought and being able to make sure our families and students are well served in this process. So our next step is board member comments. And Director Sage, you're on board again. Okay, my glasses need to be on board. So a couple weeks ago, we went to the Washington State School Director Association Conference, and I wanted to share one of the breakout sessions, things that I learned by listening in to Senator Wellman and Representative Mullet's um, sort of a preview to the coming legislative session. They are the edu Education Committee, I should note. Um, one of the things that they said the state is looking to focus on is mental health. That includes some social emotional learning as well as other strategies. Um, they're looking at the ratio of school counselors to students and also looking to support child care in all regions of the state. The interesting thing is they're considering supporting some in-home daycares and child care centers, as well as bigger, more established businesses that offer child care. And they would like to revisit SEB, the school employees benefit, state employees benefit. Benefit what? Board, thank you, state employees benefit board. Um, to look at, to understand the, um, consequence to districts to fully implement insurance for all staff, part-time or full-time, to discuss um, substitute teachers and how much this is actually costing districts to implement for benefits. And one of the things that uh, 
Representative Mullet and Senator Wellman said is they realize that this is taking, this cost is taking away from enrichment for students and other ways that this fund, these funds could be spent. So they're going to be taking a look at that and then of course they are hoping to fully fund special education. Thank you. Any other board members have things about from the WASTA conference? Any takeaways that they want to have to highlight? I attended the, uh, the law conference they had on the uh, prior day or day before opening. And it was a uh, eye opening in some respects. It was also uh, maybe question uh, some of the uh, aspects of the programs they have but uh, from the idea of how can we make them even better. And the, the, the legal uh, focuses were uh, very spot on, and it was very helpful to look at some of those from a different perspective. Excellent. No, the law conference was always, it's always impressive what they're able to put through and a lot of information very quick. Um, any other comments on WASDA? Any other general comments at all? If you would like to do that, that would be great. I went to sessions too. Um, there was a couple that I think will be good as the board has looked at adding student voice to the board. Um, one of the examples, and I would have to double check what the district was, but they had an interesting approach to involving students is that they did an action research project during the course of the year as they were also part of the board. And it was really interesting to hear about the different things and they kind of um, were doing some critical work for the district. Um, almost like research assistants, and that's one model. There was another one um, that was a little bit different than that, more like um, we have thought about, but really good to just kind of hear how that's working well in some other districts. And I had the opportunity to attend that one as well, and speaking with the students, if you ask them what their highlight was of being a board rep, it was that action research project and having the opportunity to do something that was really sort of tackling an issue that the district had and being able to pursue it. So it was a neat option. So this will be something more. We'll be looking at student voice in that piece early next year um, about what our steps are and where we want to go. Anything else? All right, so with that, we have our upcoming board meetings, which will be held on January 13th, will be our next one. We have the study session at five, followed by the board meeting at seven. And then if, also remember at the end of that month, January 25th, that is a Saturday, we have an extended study session. Um, we'll be doing some equity work and our annual work plan review and that'll be the piece where the student piece might come in um, as our strategic plan update that day. And so with that, and having no other board member comments, at this time we will go into executive session for 30 minutes and we will reconvene at 8.45, so it's gonna be 32 minutes, so at 8.45, no action will be taken following the executive session. The purpose of the exec executive session is to consider the selection of a site or the acquisition of real estate by lease or purchase and the minimum price at which real estate will be offered for sale or lease. And so with that, we will move into executive session. Thank you.